I just prayed that the Lord would help me to have the spirit of Brother Morgan in timing here today. <laughs> well, we will see. <laughs> That's a wonderful gift that God has given him. You know it and I know it. And we are so fortunate to have his ministry these last five and a half years plus. You know, I've not heard you murmur or complain. And there's gentle agreement that this is true. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember, if, 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 I, hadn't, if I had not have obeyed God, he would not be here. I did not know that Jesus would provide in this manner. I simply knew what you know, that if we obey, he will take care. He will take care of what we need. And so I'm very, very grateful. That's not all that's happened. A great prayer ministry has been raised up. But I don't want to take too long. If I keep the spirit of Brother Morgan, I must hasten. He rarely makes introductory remarks. Don't you worry, I'm not going to try to be like him. But I did want to get this in succinctly if I could. A few Sundays ago, I was preaching. or getting ready to preach in Minnesota. And, uh, oh, I'm thankful that Brother Robert Morey uh, journeyed by airplane and our Brother Rodney Dunn came to help me, to help us. Uh, Rodney Dunn drove 12 hours one way, 12 hours back. Tremendous. I was so shocked when I saw him. But they were there to hear what God had given me that morning. Uh, I, I go with my Bible. Seldom do I get anything ahead of the message or of the service itself because I, I try to find how Jesus is working in the service. Before that at White Harvest, I think, Pastor Terry, that Jesus gave me as wonderful a series of services as I've ever been privileged to be in in my life. Except for the sermon, we, Brother, uh, Brother uh, Richie told me that. God helped me also. A number of you were with me. Uh, I didn't invite anybody, but I was awfully glad to see you in uh, Tennessee. And in that same series of meetings, God helped wonderfully. And I'd just gotten in from Tucson, and I was out there with a cowboy preacher, 150, 160 persons who have, are trying to follow Jesus as we are. By the word, since then, I've gotten word that two more congregations are springing up of considerable size. That is, God is bringing them uh, and they're looking to how the Lord has taught us. One is in a very far western state and the other is in a very far southern state. I cannot speak of those congregations now. But I want you to know, if you may take this, and those of you who are not of Scott Depot proper, this is Scott Depot extended. I want you to know it's happening in other places rather rapidly now. And the calls are coming in increasingly. I, I've got calls I can't handle. But I was privileged to handle a call yesterday uh, announcing to Texas that we would be in Texas Christ Fellowship the third weekend of January. And we were happy because <laughs> they wanted us to come from sun, uh, for some time uh, remembering that we were privileged to begin that congregation through our tape ministry. Now, right to the point. I think I was in bed thinking about the service. I had been through my scriptures. I try to read five chapters in the Old Testament, five Psalms and five of the New Testament, as well as two chapters in a voice in the wilderness until I read, reached the back. I had finished whatever I was doing and God had fed me. But as of yet, I had had no operation of the spirit and I reached, I, re, I just reached for the book recently written by, by the Pope. And when I did, the Holy Spirit operated with me. I opened to the first part there and it says, it says, how do you know how to pray? Right there, the Holy Spirit operated with me. I thought they're asking the Pope who has the prayers of Augustine and Chrysostom and, and he has the prayers of the great Anselm. He, he's got more liturgy than you and I've ever thought about. They're asking him how to pray. And his answer to the reporter, it's written in question and answer form, this book on holiness that's out. He answered him this way, I don't know how to pray. He said, I, may I refer you to Romans eight twenty six. He said, but the Holy Spirit helps me in my weakness. Well, 
not only did he have my attention, the Holy Spirit was getting my attention because he had operated with me just before. That is, I had a movement of glory go through me and I thought, my, my, how unexpected and how wonderful. But when I opened it and it began on prayer, I began to understand. Now, I didn't get this message in the Pope's book, but as he mentioned Romans 8, 26, God gave me implied theology. Because I saw the connection between Romans 8, 26 and 8, 28. It's never happened to me in my life. I found it written in no book, nor has any man ever taught me. But it's a joy to share it with you today. So we read these passages and then I share with you something I think may quicken you and encourage you by God's grace. 26, I do want to refer that in the 18th verse, Paul's talking about suffering. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth... Maybe I better read this all for context. So if you have your Bible, stay with me or just listen from the NIV. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. I'll have to throw in an extra point here for daughter Naomi. (laughs) This tells us that the animals and the life around us, that is all of nature around us will be transformed, not destroyed. Because there's a word about being destroyed by fire. And that sounds like that's a paradox. And we don't know just how to figure that out. But this tells us that creation will be transformed, not destroyed. Uh, That's just extra. But it's thrown in for one who cares. And maybe you do too. It means a lot to me. Now, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. As in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. So here we have the Holy Spirit within. We have the, whole, the groaning of creation. But we have a groaning, and all the more so, we're, we have a groaning for, because we're creatures. But we have a groaning that's more intense than that and more meaningful because the, it's the Holy Spirit who's been given to us as the first fruits of redemption and in the expectation of full redemption where they shall be transformed, we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye and given bodies that are not like these deteriorating bodies that we have now. That's great. And he says, for in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all who hopes for what he already has. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And here comes Romans 8, 26, to whom John Paul II referred and the Holy Spirit dealt with me when he did, I read. In the same way, now this is now, this other groaning is for that which is ultimate and complete. But what about now? So in the same way now, if I may add a word, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. I'll go ahead and read 28, 29. It tells us the reason why. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, and here's the reason why, to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he, being Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And though he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, I'm sitting there and I suddenly see, through the help of the Holy Spirit, implied, not explicit theology. Explicit is obvious here, but implied theology. I see the connection between 826 and 828. And this is it. Let me back up to give you this and I'll step into it. 
God spoke the first world into existence and he didn't need us at all. He said, let there be light and there was light. He let, let there be this and there was this. Let there be this and there was this. But the spiritual word of the work of the kingdom cannot be brought into existence by his speaking without us. This world is brought into existence because we have faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This world is brought into existence because you and I are co-creators with him. And through prayer, this world comes into existence. John Wesley said, and it never worked without prayer. It is brought into existence with prayer. Some heard me speak about this at um, White Iris and then on into Tennessee also. But it's a, it, that's quite a thought. <laughs> That he limits himself. He has limited himself. And it was uh, the great Pascal who said the primary reason of prayer is creation. He creates through us. We're joint heirs with him. <laughs> We've been blessed, raised to the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And when he speaks the word, we hear the word and we pray that world into existence. This morning we prayed a world into existence for someone or someones. Someone was saved. He said, how do you know? I know because of what happened to me within. I know because of the movement of the Holy Spirit and the prophecy that was given to me before. Sure, this is silly to the world, even to the world of the religionists. But I'm telling you, friends, Christianity is supernatural and without it, there is no... There is no it isn't good at all. And so he works. Don't you love this thought itself? Now, now listen to this. I haven't gotten to the main point of what he showed me. But this will surprise you, I think. Because see, that's explicit theology. But implied theology, the sort of underneath. Now, you and I pray what we hear and a world is prayed into existence and we bring it to pass. We maintain grace. We see bodies healed. We can even see the death raised. That will come. That will come again by God's grace and mercy. We will see people come back from the dead. Hallelujah. Because he speaks it and we believe it and it's brought into existence. But while we're praying, we're praying oftentimes imperfectly. Seems like most of the time. Unless he tells us what to pray, we really don't know what to pray for. But while we're praying, there is someone praying within us who prays perfectly. Jesus in us, the hope of glory through the Holy Spirit is praying perfect prayers. Jesus in his glorified body is at the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit groans within us and he sends up perfect prayers. He sends out perfect prayers that create Romans 8, 28. He's sending out prayers about you. He searched your heart. He knows the mind of the spirit. And as he sends up those prayers, he forms around you a perfect existence. That is, he forms around you a perfect wall, a perfect mesh, a perfect pattern of things that will bring you to Christ's likeness and excludes everything else. That's implied theology. I never got it except I was in bed in Minnesota and it fell on me when I read that the Pope depends on the Holy Spirit for his praying. And I'm so excited about it. Because the Holy Spirit prays from our... See, now it doesn't happen if you don't pray. While you're praying for mother and father, while you're praying for son and daughter, while you're praying for the church services, while you're praying for those abroad, while you're praying for this and all things that are in your mind, and those things revealed by the Spirit outside yourself, He is searching your heart. He is searching the mind of the Spirit. And what He is doing is excluding and including that which will bring you to Christ's likeness. That is, He will not let anything in there that doesn't bring you to Christ's likeness. And he brings into your life that which will bring Christ likeness. Because the Holy Spirit prays the perfect prayers when you and I are in prayer. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that all the call, uh, the call according to his purpose. Is that exciting or not? <laughs> Brothers, let me tell you something. You may not have gotten much done with your objective prayers, but I want you to know the Holy Spirit's got a whole lot done while you were trying to pray. He said, my house 
That's the body of Christ. Shall be a house of prayer. And all along, while you and I have been struggling in prayer, the Holy Spirit has been praying up a perfect surrounding circumstances. You say, Pastor, they've not been all pleasant. I said perfect, not pleasant. Where in this world did you and I ever conceive in our minds that circumstances had to be pleasant in order to be perfect? No, if you want that kind of circumstances, you do not have perfect circumstances. I'm talking about perfect circumstances. Paul was to receive so many revelations that God had to put a, a thorn in his flesh in order to keep things perfect. It was so heavy and it was so rugged, he wanted it removed. But he says, I can't do it. My grace is sufficient. That was a negative blessing in this cup of suffering and blessings. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> he said, this brings us to Christ's likeness. This also brings us to oneness out of whom the spirit will come. He said, and I'm going to try to close with this, but I want you to read with me in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, uh, 12, uh, 7. These words and the following words. To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. We pray for the perfect will of God and don't know why the devil gets after us so hard. The answer is right here. Now, the more saintly you become, the more Christ-like you become, the more you experience the torment of Satan. Do I read that correctly? Who's willing to get in this battle? Who's willing to join this army? Who's willing to become a saint? Who's willing to let God form the circumstances around him that he's faithful in prayer and so God puts perfect circumstances that will bring him to Christ's light, likeness. Martyrdom if necessary. But God's choosing. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, listen to this, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will all the more gladly boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. These are the perfect wall, my friend, that the Holy Spirit prayed in. He didn't pray it in. What man can say, I pray my share of hardships in? No. No, no, we pray for whatever we're supposed to pray for. The Holy Spirit will pray for our hardships. I've been with you. I've been with some in this church a year to two years to three, and I saw such saintliness, and I knew what they were headed for. I didn't know I would be headed for some things myself. I pray that's a sign of saintliness. But for the ones I knew when I came, I knew what they were headed for without the theology. Now I have a little theology. Implied but pretty obvious when you look into it, is it not? <laughs> Glory to God. I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. This is the wall that God's put up to bring me to Christ likeness and to bring the church to oneness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I must remind you that Paul had the greatest evidence of God's perfect wall around him. I wonder if you'd like this in your wall. I were, um, I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea and I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and gone without food. I've been cold and naked and besides, besides that I have the pressure of the concern of all the churches. That was Paul's perfect wall. And we know that God calls us all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them that, them that are the called according to his purpose. Are, are you going to have to take that and pray about it for a while? 
I want to walk with God. You want to walk with God. I want God's presence. You want God's presence. But are we prepared for that which is perfect around us? It, even if it be a messenger for Satan, because if we've had very much glory, we've got to have something to keep our humility. Oh, I never have preached a sermon like this on Advent in my life. But I offer you hope. <laughs> I offer you encouragement. I offer you an explanation for why it seems that it's rough sometimes. You're not Paul, so this is not your wall. But you have one also fitted perfectly to your needs. And I have one also fitted perfectly to mine. But while I am praying, the Holy Spirit is seeing that all things around me are coming together for good in my life Amen. and the life of those that I influence. Isn't that marvelous? Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Romans 8, 26, 8, 28. If any man's preached it, I don't know anything about it yet. There's nothing new under the sun. Let, let's sum up with Philippians 1, 12. Philippians 1, 12, Paul said this. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It took us a long time to see it, but when finally the Bible was put together, we saw that what happened to the Apostle Paul served to get the gospel to me and to you. Are you willing to be used of God? Are you willing to keep praying? so that he may form around you that perfect wall, that perfect pattern of circumstances that will take you straight to Christ's likeness and bring you to oneness within the body of Christ. By God's grace, I want to be, and as far as I know, I am willing. And any man that perseveres in obedience is a willing person, any person, any person of humankind, Jesus, we want to thank you for the privilege of speaking to our people this morning. Now, Lord, it could be that Henry Light's wonderful and great song that he wrote when he first went to Laura Brixham in Devonshire. Maybe this song will make more sense to it now than it would have if Jeannie had sung before the message. Let's hear that song in Jesus' name. that in the middle of his ministry he wrote praise my soul the king of heaven 800 children in the Sunday school 80 teachers just to teach the children the fishermen grew to love him and he put a bible on every boat but that was the same man that 23 years later because of ill health had the devil creep into his congregation and take nearly all support away until in that last day his choir wouldn't even sing for him and he left that treasury, abide with me, with him, into the hands of Charles Potter, his gardener. I preached this one day, the day that Momo's wedding took place and the day that we announced Tina's death. But when he first, after being so wonderfully blessed, maybe as beautiful a man as John Dunn, he was sent to this little fishing village and there he died to himself. And out of dying to self, he wrote this song. What he did not know was that God, or he may have known, was God was forming a perfect wall to bring him to Christ's likeness and feed the church for decades. Jesus, I might cry. Oh